hello guys good afternoon and welcome back to my youtube channel today we are going to be reviewing the worst croissant so make sure to stay tuned so you can learn all the mistakes that you should never make while making croissant on the agenda is to make croissant dough from scratch and Kindle's actually going to be the one directing me from behind the camera. Into a stand mixture, I'm combining all-purpose flour, bread flour, sugar, yeast, and combining the salt with the milk first to help it dissolve. And while the salt becomes one with the milk, I'm going to mix the dry ingredients first using a hook attachment and going on a low speed until the dry ingredients are incorporated. And once everybody in the dry ingredients are now friends, I'm going to add in the salty milk followed by some softened butter. Back up into the hook, followed by a couple minutes of forceful beating until the dough is nice and smooth. And throughout the course of these next few minutes, I'm stopping in and using the hook to scrape down any of the sides so that everybody can actually become friends. After repeating this a couple of times, the dough is now ready to be moved. So I'm oiling up a bowl and transferring all the dough. So guys, so far now there are two mistakes. First, the dough is over mixed. It's not supposed to be that mixed. And the second mistake is that uh, when you finish making the dough, you have to chill the dough for about 12 hours before you start to laminate the dough. Do not mix the dough and immediately start to laminate. It's very wrong. Keeping me inspired, I'm able to get this into the shape that I want. Thanks, Kendall. The next step is to cut out a rectangle of parchment paper that approximately represents the size of the butter block that is going inside this dough. After cutting a shape that fits well within the safety margins of this dough, and obviously with the help of Kendall again, I'm going to try and attempt to slide this dough back onto the tray so that it can go into the fridge to chill. The dough that made it onto the tray is not the same shape as the dough that was on the table, so after fixing it up and making sure that the parchment fits one more time, it's time for a quick nap in the fridge. Wait, hold up, that's illegal. This is a block of butter. And so next, I'm gonna throw the block of butter in the mixer. In the mixer. In the mixer. I'm gonna throw the... I'm gonna throw the, there you go, that followed by some all-purpose flour, and I'm gonna combine these with the attachment that is not the hook one until the butter and the flour have forcefully become friends. Again, stopping from time to time to use a spatula and scraping down the sides to make sure that everybody is together. I had actually never realized that the butter block used for croissant actually has flour inside of it. Kendall explained this has something to do with the way that it stabilizes and makes it easier to work with, so I'm just happy I get to hang out with her because I get to learn all these cool things. Once the consistency has been approved, I'm now allowed to go on to the envelope stage where I'm placing the paste inside a large piece of parchment paper and using the smaller piece as a guide for how large the final block should be. I like to call it the envelope stage because it's like folding the butter into a nice little package to be delivered right into the middle of the dough. A really cool trick here is to use the rolling pin and press the butter and roll it into the sides and edges of the envelope. That way you get these nice sharp corners and everything fits well. After a couple minutes of coaxing the butter into its shape, this little package is ready to be mailed right into the fridge. Now that both the dough and the butter have been sufficiently chilled, it's time to combine them together. I'm peeling the butter off of the parchment and placing it carefully onto one side of the dough. We're basically going to be making a butter pop tart here. It's also important to brush up any excess flour, especially towards the seams, as that's going to prevent us from closing the butter pop tart together. So after brushing off any excess flour, we're going to pinch together the sides carefully but forcefully. And after shaping it back into a rectangle, we're going to transfer the butter calzone back onto a tray with ceramic wrap. Heat is our number one enemy through this entire process. The butter has to be cold. So to ensure that we're going to take this butter calzone and give it multiple naps in the fridge. Once everything is nice and cold again, we're going to bring the dough back out, sprinkle with some bench flour and use the rolling pin to make four indents across the dough. This helps the dough roll out smoother and prevents any butter from squishing out the other side when rolling using a rolling pin. The goal right now is to get the dough into a long rectangular shape. We're brushing off any excess flour and then we're going to do what is called a three quarters full, taking one side of the dough, bringing it 75% of the way across and using the other side of the dough to meet it where the first fold ends. I'm not exactly 
exactly sure what the science is, but I believe this helps make four layers and prevents the seam from being exposed to the edges of the croissant. And even though I don't fully understand what's going on, I trust Kendall with my complete heart. So if this is the way she says it should be done, that is the way it should be done. Now go put my baby in the fridge again. Now that the dough has been chilled again, we're going to repeat the process, indenting it, flouring it, rolling it out into a rectangular shape, but this time we're going to do what is called a book fold, folding one half of it two thirds of the way across and then folding the remaining dough over that first fold, making sure to brush off any flour in the meantime. It's also really important to stretch out the corners so that they meet the edges of the rest of the dough so that the whole thing looks as much of a rectangle as it can, like a book. Usually I'd put this back in the fridge, but the dough is still cold, so I'm going to continue doing the same thing we did before, doing another book fold. At this point, we've done four folds multiplied by three folds and multiplied again by three folds. That's 36 folds. But if my math is right, we have many more folds to go. So back in the fridge and back out again. Here we go. Flour, indent, roll, fold. Three times 36 is 108. Flour, indent, roll, fold. 3 times 108 is 324. 324 layers are inside this dough. All that's left is to shape and bake. After one more time in the fridge, we're still going to roll this dough out with the same process, but instead of a small rectangle, we're aiming for a large rectangle approximately quarter of an inch thick, and we're trimming the edges with a pizza cutter so that we can shape the croissants into a nice triangular tapered shape. And with a little bit of that control C, control V magic, we now have a gadget that is five pizza cutters all lined up. This is going to go down the length of the dough until we get nice even lines, cutting this into nice even strips. Ooh, that's nice. And with the help of the first pizza cutter, we're going to bisect each rectangle along its hypotenuse. Honestly, not helping the stereotype here, but we're going to make these croissants one way or another. Kendall showed me a trick where you use a knife and make a small cut at the base of each triangle. This apparently helps with the rolling and shaping of the croissants, but I think I'm just going to let her show you how it's done. Here I am watching earnestly as Kendall elongates the strip of the dough, followed by opening up the legs towards the base and rolling up the croissant into its final form. Tight rolls are key, so she's also stretching the dough as she is rolling, which gives the croissant a longer and more elegant life cycle when it comes to the rolled shape. Wow, it's not that tight. it should be very tight so that the improves properly in the rolling of the croissant so shape not inside good the should be perfect. mainly because it's not tight, especially from the beginning. It's not tight, it should be very tight so that the improves properly in the shape inside the cone should be perfect. Mm, amazing. It's always good to be creative. Mm, amazing. It's always good to be creative. Alright, back to the crazy croissant. I'm going to make a simple syrup because in the show, they specify that the high sugar content inside the croissant is what created that deep degree of caramelization and dark color found in the final product. So I thought this could be a cool test to run alongside the egg wash, which I'm going to be making by using a separated egg yolk and combining that along with a little bit of sugar and some cream. All right, now it's time for the fun part. Our little rolls have proof, our glazes are ready, and now I'm gonna brush half of the rolls with egg wash and half of them with the sugar syrup. It's important here that you don't agitate or brush any of the washes on the cross section where you see the layers. Having any egg wash or sugar syrup stuck in the layers may bind them together, preventing them from rising. We spent so much time and effort on those layers that I wanna make sure that these can grow up to their fullest potential. So after delicately trying to brush only the tops, these are going in a pretty hot oven around 400 and 450 degrees. There's a beautiful time lapse that Brad shot just to show you the transformation and voila, this is round one. But the thing is, even though these look perfect, they're not done. I'm brushing each one with a little bit of sugar syrup. You can clearly tell that the egg wash is getting a more intense color, but these are going back in the oven at the same temperature to try and create that deep caramelized crust. Here is a, another time lapse shot by Brad, beautiful work, and these are looking quite, quite dark.
croissant with a spoon, we end up with a pretty beaten up roll. But you can see that there's a lot of layers. I don't really count 314, but I think we can do better. So this is actually one that we've taken completely to the point of burnt. It, it smells terrible in here. Yep, here it is, folks. Hey, Kendall, what do you think? Kendall is absolutely thrilled with the end result. Without further ado, I think it's time to crack this open and see if we can salvage something. All right, all right, wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait, there's no way this is working. We actually got a golden brown croissant to emerge from that darkness. There's just a really dark part at the bottom. I don't know if Andrew, you wanna try this? Oh, he does, so, all right, my dude, here we go. Take one for the team, I guess, cheers. Oh, oh, oh no, oh, oh no, oh, that is, that is disgusting. That is, why did we not cut off the burnt part off the bottom? Because the golden part. Guys, when making a croissant, it's very, very simple, but you need to follow the steps. Mainly, once your dough is ready, you need to chill the dough overnight. The next day now, you need to laminate, laminate one double fold and then one single fold then you need to cut your dough and then roll it once it's rolled you can you can freeze for some times or directly you can proof and then bake do not bake too much you bake for about uh, 20 minutes at a temperature of 170 degrees celsius and you're good to go you get a golden brown croissant which is very flaky and very soft from inside with amazing honeycombs make sure to like and to subscribe see you guys on our next video bye bye for now